a webinar. Very excited about it. Um, you know, we are um, approaching hopefully a more normal time. I, I've shared with a lot of my clients right now that it's so funny. As soon as like life started feeling normal, where you get in the rotation, you get in the flow, you get in the schedule. Kids are back in school. Kids aren't going virtual again. All this stuff started just like really clicking, and then all of a sudden, poof! It's summer break, and now there goes our schedules. But it's totally fun in a different way. Um, but also looking into coming out to the fall and then also on the back half this year, looking forward to seeing a lot of you guys in person. I've, you know, I've been feeling a lot. The business gets done just fine on Zoom, but it's it's not as much fun and certainly not as personal. So, um, but it is nice to be able to do something like this and, and reach and get in front of a lot of y'all um, who are maybe in different areas geographically. Um, and that's been a real plus here. So, so to start with, let's just open up in prayer and um, go from there. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you that we can all get together and um, think about our finances and help us when we think about our finances to really focus on the things that are most important and not um, get sidetracked by all the noise and so many things um, out there uh, fighting for our attention, Lord, and help us to focus on the, on the wise things and the things that will really um, move us and our relationships forward. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. So there we go. Slow computer. Here's your security disclosures. I'll let y'all do a show of ha virtual hands on once you've read it. And once I see everybody's hand, we'll move on. All right. I see everybody's good. <laughs> All right. So what are we going to talk about today? So as always, it's the three sections that we're going to discuss. We're going to have a segment on investment planning. What are we doing with your account? And, um, you know, what do we see in the economy? How does that impact them? What possible changes have we made or are we going to make? Um, advanced planning. So what is a financial planning idea outside of investments? And this one is called taking the long view, which I think plays very well into the investment planning right now. But it plays into a lot of other things. And, and I'll give you guys an example when we get there on uh, maybe some budgeting things and way to, ways that taking the long view can help you think about those better. And then on the relationship management side, I'm um, going to interview uh, Rachel Keller, um, absolutely one of my favorite uh, people in our professional network to work with. Our clients give great feedback, and she's going to take us through sort of the ins and outs of the probate process and how to more easily navigate that. So with that, if you have questions along the way, please um, feel free to just interject. You can write them in a uh, chat, and uh, Beth, you all heard earlier, is kind of a newer marketing associate we have. Juliana, it looks like, is on this call, too. They'll be monitoring that and let us know if there's any questions, or just interrupt. You know, there's a small enough number of us on here that we can make it very intimate and uh, talk about that along the way, too. So, um, so basically, what is the landscape we see? Um, you know, what's happening? So, first of all, Stocks and bonds are becoming more correlated. That's always interesting because you are constantly trying to figure out how do you diversify the portfolio. And when those start to be correlated, you have to start to look at alternatives. And there are certain strategies that we're doing some due diligence on, absolute return strategies and things like that. And I wouldn't say we're ready to roll out, but because of this correlation, we are starting to have a little bit more interest. Plus, as interest rates continue to climb, if that happens, um, you know, bonds may have a very different uh, view. Then growth and value. So growth stocks, if you think about it, one side of the S&P 500 value, for a while, those were moving a lot together. And now they're really not. You're, t having t you're seeing flows from one to the other. Inflation's certainly been on the rise. Earnings are posting a record high. And we know that infrastructure is going to be spent, and that'll add to the economy. All those are positive things. And all with the backdrop of the tax picture kind of worsening a little bit. And a lot of times people will look at any of these variables in a vacuum and, for example, say, Aren't, isn't raising taxes bad for the economy and therefore the market will go down? Well, and we'll talk about this when we get to the tax section, raising taxes is bad for the economy. But if you combine it with all these positives, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be a shrinking economy. It's just meaning it's not going to be as strong of an economy as if you kept taxes the same or cut taxes. So we'll look at that there. And of course, as we know, you know, this infrastructure is a positive for the economy. And if you're going to have government spending, somebody's got to pay for it. Unfortunately, that happens to be you, American citizens. So 
sorry, when I try to change these slides, for whatever reason, my computer is being slow today. All right. So this is a really positive slide. This is basically talking about manu uh, de uh, deliveries of goods in the United States. And as you'll see, we're at an all-time high. And that's great because when I mean, you hear the ideas of inflation raising and some of the concerns on inflation, a lot of it comes back to supply chain. And with that being not necessarily that um, you know people can't don't want to buy things like a car, but they can't build enough to meet the demand and therefore prices rise. Well, as you start to see these deliveries, and a lot of it has to do with manufacturing that stopped during COVID, goods and services that couldn't get shipped around the world during COVID, factories that couldn't build, and that's starting to recover and starting to normalize. And that's why we, along with the Federal Reserve, really feel like this inflation spike is transitory, meaning temporary. And these deliveries that you're seeing, and you've actually seen it throughout the, the month of June, economy, um, commodities have come down a lot. But this is uh, leading towards replenishing of um, inventories and, you know, probably back to a more normal look on the pricing of things. And then one thing to show is really if you look at the inflation landscape, um, come on, computer. All right. In low but rising inflation, equities continue to be the best performing asset class from a historical perspective. And so if inflation is between 1% and 3%, still equities are the best. Deflation, actually, if it's low but above 1% and, and rising, equities are great. You know, there is a time where it's falling and then actually bonds can become better than stocks because you believe interest rates are going to go down and that's a tailwind. But in this situation, inflation above 3 and falling, stocks are really good. Where it gets scary is when it's above 3 and rising. See that right here? And if it's above three and falling, that's a very different picture. And because of what I just showed on the last slide with deliveries, we think that um, it is falling. And then also, here is a huge positive. S&P 500 margins, so basically meaning the profit margins of companies, are at an all-time high and, and setting records here. So, um, you know, if let's say you buy an iPhone from Apple, just to go through um, profit margins real quick. You buy a $500 iPhone for a Apple, you know, their profit margin is obviously bigger if they're able to build that for $300, sell it to you for $500, than if they're able to build that for $400 and sell it to you for $500, because, um, you know, the $200 is bigger profit. So that's a good sign um, for equities. And then also, um, earnings per share are up significantly. Um, and there's two different ways of looking at earnings per share. There's operating earnings per share, and then this thing called GAAP, which is more of an accounting way of looking at it. it has to do a lot with when the cash flows occur. But both of those are, are uh, raising up significantly, making it an environment first time we've seen in years. And I showed this last month, too. But if you look at basically the last four or five years, markets are going up, but earnings weren't going up to – to match it. And so what you had is what's called multiple expansion. So multiple expansion simply means this. You earn $1,000 in a business and I'm willing to pay you $5,000 to buy that business. Well, that's five times the value of your earnings, right? If all of a sudden someone else comes and says, I'm willing to pay you seven times the value of your earnings. Well, now you're getting 7,000 for your business, but your earnings are still $1,000. And so all I'm doing is expanding the multiple of how much I'm willing to pay you for your business. And that happens from time to time, and that's an okay environment, but it's not infinitely sustainable. What really starts looking good is I will only pay you five times for your business, but now all of a sudden, instead of earning $1,000 in that business, you're earning $2,000. Well, if I keep that same multiple, now all of a sudden, if I'm buying that business, I'm buying for 10,000 versus 5,000. And so you see a real nice increase there based on um, earnings. And then um, rising earning expectations set up a strong ramp up in 2021. So the continued expectations is that that's going to continue through 2021 and at least most of 2022, from what I've heard. Um, a lot of economists are saying things kind of more normalized with a little less growth in 2023. But I tell you what, think back to 2019. You tried to predict what 2020 would look like when you were in 2019. Any of you guys think you might have done that a little bit wrong? So all that to say, you know, I can really look out at 18 months, but going much longer than that, so much can change. I wouldn't worry about what those consensus look like. 
And then to the government spending side of it, and obviously the infrastructure um, bill we talked about earlier in the uh, backdrop on the economic landscape, kind of some tailwinds for the market, and I'm going to show you something on taxes next. But um, the Biden plan, and, and one thing I really, and this is just my personal belief, um, I think on both the infrastructure plan and the tax plan, I think the Biden administration is starting from a really good position to negotiate and come back to the middle and not necessarily going to get what they say. Um, and I think that for both sides of that, and, you know, we're, we'll see what the watered down version ends up being, but I thought this was interesting. And, you know, it's one of those, remember what news source you're watching, because there's always different ways of spinning things. So I'll spin this a few different ways. First of all, if you look at $6. trillion, how big is that? It's well, it's the equivalent of the GDP of all these states, 23 states, okay, which is pretty dramatic. Wow, 23 states. I bet if you wanted to um, make this look different, you could also say it is less than the GDP of California or less than the GDP of New York. So, you know, it's a lot of money, but, um, you know, depending on how you spend that, you can make it seem bigger or smaller than it truly is, I think. And then on the tax side, what I'm seeing out of the current proposal, and this is just you know where things are today, and, and just to throw this out for folks, and um, if you look at it, one of them is uh, you know down here is um, maritime jointly, down here it's individuals. What they're really talking about is anybody below this level, so below about $400,000, not much is gonna change. Hardly anything is going to change except maybe the step up in basis, which is something I think is being proposed and going to get negotiated away, that they would take that out. But if you're above 400000 you are going to have some pretty significant increases. And so, you know, I'm just throwing that out as far as for people on the call, I think there's a lot of reasons to be concerned about taxes going up, but not necessarily that you're going to be directly impacted by those changes. All right, before I go into taking the long view. Any thoughts, questions, joys, concerns on investments or taxes? All right, cool. All right, so let's go to the long view and how that can impact financial success. And I'm going to talk about this in a lot of different ways. Um, obviously, you guys can read the stuff that's on the slide. I mean, any of us who are investors know that um, you know, it's a long-term perspective. Looking at short-term returns can really make you make mistakes. But I want to take it a step further. I mean, certainly if you run a business, you know the same thing. You know, investing in your business for down the road. Um, I want people to start thinking in these terms a little bit on those lines, but also when, when trying to manage your family. And it's really, you know, it's sometimes we can get. Uh, bucket it in. And it's amazing the amount of people, I'll give you a great example with COVID, who thought things like, oh my gosh, we're never going to need office space again. Well, guess what? If you take a long view on that, go out three years, it might be a little different. People might be doing a hybrid, but I bet people are going to be going to offices more than they did over the last year. Um, I'm on the finance committee of my church, and they were really asking questions uh, last year, like, can our... Um, preschool ever make money? Is it self-sustainable or should we just close it down? Well, think about that, guys. Take the long view. And in 2023, odds are this preschool is going to be just as profitable as it was in 2019. Stop worrying about 2020. And I think of some of the goals that I've seen people have stress with on their finances. Um, and I'll give you all a great example in my life. And this is just part of my personal story that formed me. Um, and so much of this comes out of, um, and we did a presentation earlier this week on family brand and family um, constitution. And a lot of it, you know, you learn values from the family and that helps impact the decisions you make. Well, um, one of the hardest things my wife and I ever struggled with financially was uh, fertility issues. And at a time where neither of us was making much money, and as y'all know, those, those things are expensive. Well, from a long view perspective, we couldn't have done anything better for our life and meeting our long-term goals than if to spend what felt like too much money at the time. And now everything worked out. And I've seen you guys and people um, who I work with get stressed out during a college education period, a um, wedding that's coming up, um, you know, 
knowing that they got to float a mortgage while something's in probate or, or while, you know, owning two houses, but eventually that one's going to sell. And all these things do cause stress. And I'm not saying to not let them, but when you take a longer perspective, um, I, I remember, you know, one time when I was talking about my finances with my dad, who's also an advisor, and I said, you know, how, how is this going to work, you know, to ever save enough for retirement? My dad goes, all right, change that number. Let me show you what you're actually going to do. And he's exactly right. You know, now that I'm uh, older, it's like, this is what I'm actually going to do. And it just made a perspective to not look so linearly. And please know that with your investments and in and, and other areas. The one reason I think this is so important to talk about right now is we've been spoiled over the last year as an investor perspective. And we've also been, I think, a little jaded on the personal perspective by this COVID environment. What I mean by spoiled as an investor is markets have gone straight up. What I mean by jaded is we've started to think things are going to be more COVID-ish than possibly they will, but we'll all see. And so how do you end up doing this? First of all, you got to start with the end in mind and a well-conceptualized plan with goals and numbers that one, what keeps you motivated? When you think over a long period of time, and I've heard someone say, it's often amazing how little we can achieve over a short amount of time and unbelievable how much we can achieve over a long amount of time. How do you stay motivated to keep to the goal? And I'll give you a great example on that. We all have certain goals we want to do, but the way you, um, and I'll give you a great example of that. A uh, goal of probably a lot of people on this call is to be healthy. And to be healthier 12 months from now than they are today. Okay, that's great. But if your goal is to be healthier and you're like me and you hate running, don't go out and try to turn yourself into a runner. Find another exercise like yoga, for example, that you actually enjoy and will do. Um, you know, if you're somebody who some people, you know, find that stuff that keeps you motivated and don't, don't do it too big. You know, I want to be healthier a year from now. Well, I'm going to fail if I say I'm going to work out five days a week, but I could probably succeed if I say I'm going to work out two or three days a week. You get the point there? Helping focus on the process and activities that really matter and avoid distractions. I mean, how often is good the enemy of great, in a sense? And we focus on the day-to-day, -day, but not on that long vision. And, you know, that's the, the thing in life where it's, you know, I knew I wanted to achieve this thing, but I got so busy doing laundry that it never happened sort of thing helping you concentrate on your actions productively and helping you stay on the path as times get hard. No matter what your goal is, there's going to be times it's hard to achieve or else it's not really a goal, right? It's just something you do. It's something that would automatically happen. And then on that, let's plot out some intermediate goals to know if we're on track. So I'll give you a great example from a financial perspective. Um, I'm about 40 years old. And let's say I want to retire at 65. Well, I know how I think I know about how much money I should have at 65. And it's kind of a nebulous number because I don't know exactly what my life's going to look like at 65. But an intermediate goal, knowing I have that long term goal, would be how much do I want to have saved by the time I'm 45 or 43? Or a short term goal, how much do I want to save this year? And so, you know, your long term goal could be uh, I want to be healthier 12 months from now. But the thing is, what do I want to accomplish this week and over the next month to get me there? And if, in your finances, this could be, you know, it could be a lot of different things. Um, it could be a giving goal. Okay, you know, I want to start more charitable giving, but I need to adjust my budget over time. If we're going to be a family that starts tithing 12 months from now, how do we make adjustments now to get us there? Um, and then execute on your plan. So, you know, no plan is of any use unless you actually execute it. And a lot of times that's where the rubber meets the road. And, and if you look at business, especially, the people that execute tend to be the ones that are successful, not necessarily the ones with the best ideas. It's really often the best execution. So, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, and I think this is very true, I don't necessarily care what you know, I care what you do. And obviously to do the right things, you have to know certain things, but, um, you know, making sure you are implementing those. And then, of course, no matter what it is, the importance of perseverance, and then always um, try to remain flexible because you might have that long-term goal or even like in my situation, I want to have a certain amount of money by the time I'm 45. Well, if, if life throws you a curveball, um, 
you know, I'll give you a great example. Someone in your family becomes sick and you have to spend more money than anticipated paying for, for that. You got to adapt. Um, you know, I've had clients in retirement um, have a spending goal and then some of their children may struggle with something and we have to get a little bit flexible on that. But just know that's going to happen because um, whenever you make plans in life, God laughs, right? So start with the end of mind, develop intermediate goals, and let's go execute. All right, so with that, I will introduce Ms. Rachel Keller. And Rachel is a estate planning uh, attorney at uh, Hill & Watch Co. Uh, she also helps people through the probate process and executing on that. Um, I will leave it, let's see, we'll leave this up for a second, and then I can just um, even stop sharing screens, and we can put on speaker view for the um, conversation. But, you know, for some of you who have been through the probate process, maybe you're the executor, a lot of this you might know. Some of you, this might be a complete mystery. And I tell you what, when we were talking about this before, I found this to be a very um, interesting conversation simply because it's one of those things that it's, and I feel like this with our clients that retire, they've never retired before. And so talking to somebody with experience in that area can be really useful. So Rachel, why don't you just give us a quick introduction, what makes you passionate about doing the things you do, and then we'll jump into the probate conversation. Yeah, hi, good afternoon. I actually want to start by saying I really appreciate your, well, the stock stuff kind of goes over my head, but I really appreciate what you're talking about goal planning. I, several of the things that you just said really spoke to me where I'm at right now in my life, not getting overwhelmed, short-term goals, and, you know, just kind of forest for the trees types of stuff. So thank you very much for that inspiration. Uh, for everyone else, I'm Rachel Keller. I, um, I'm an estate planning probate attorney up in the Alpharetta area. So hopefully some of you are local to me. Um, and I actually switched over to this practice after about seven years doing insurance defense for a big insurance company in town. And frankly, I didn't like not knowing my clients. I didn't not, like not getting to pick my clients and being told this is my client. And um, so I made the switch and I love getting to to meet people and help people and know people. And I think one of the most best parts about it is that I'm getting long-term relationships with people that I didn't get in my prior practice. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Yeah, two things that stand out about Rachel, just to uh, mention this is one, her bedside manner and the clients always have good things to say about that. And then second, when I first met her and talked about why she's passionate on a state, she said, I love it that everyone can win. And if done well, there are no winners and losers. It's just executing goals, whereas in litigation, someone always won and someone always lost. And I thought that was a really cool perspective. Um, so on probate, which is, you know, we're talk not talking the whole picture of a state, we're focusing on that. First of all, in this may be useful for some people, may not, but just define it for us. What is probate? Sure. Yeah, it's always kind of fun. So probate literally just means proof. Um, what that means in terms of what are we doing when we are probating, that is a process of an individual has passed away with a last will and testament. And so we take the last will and testament and we file it with the probate court and we ask the court basically to put that stamp on that will and say yes that was that deceased individual's last will and testament. So they are literally proving that that will is the valid last will and testament of the person. And then once they have proved the will, it's admitted to probate, it just means it's, it's valid. And then the court issues letters testamentary to the executor of the will, which is their marching orders to go and administer the estate. Okay. And you mentioned the executor. You're the executor of a will. And a good question is, have you ever had an experience with people that were the executor and didn't know they were possibly? But what should the first step be for an executor to take? Uh, I would say, well, if you know that you're the executor of the will, first thing should be to go ahead and hunt down the original will. Hopefully the uh, deceased individual has told you where their will is um, and they've it's great if they've given you a copy or at least they've said, hey, if you ever need it, my will is in my X. Great places, you're safe at home, you're fireproof, waterproof, safe. Some people will put it in a safety deposit box. Um, and that's okay as long as somebody else has access to that box so that they can get into it if, you, you know, if you're not here anymore. So I would say find the will. After you found the will, go ahead and take that will um, to your local 
a probate attorney just to get some advice on what are the next steps. Um, kind of the analysis of do we need to do probate or not do probate. Um, and then other things to consider, a lot of times this happens already if, if the executor and the family of the deceased individual are the same people, but consider you know, notifying social security, getting death certificates, final arrangements, funeral arrangements, things like that, kind of locking down the house to make sure it's secure just in the interim until you can figure out what's next. Okay. Um, question, you, you said original will, and I know a lot of us have um, kind of like, you know, especially electronic documents, like a scanned in version of our will that maybe our executor or kids have. Um, a lot of times people will leave that stuff with their financial advisor or state planning attorney, you know, go to them. Like, I know a lot of people would call us first and we'd be like, oh, here's the will. So do you have to literally have it with a wet signature or can a scan in version stored on Dropbox work? Okay, so what Georgia law says is that the default position is if your executor, your dominated executor in your documents or whoever cannot find your original will with a wet signature, Georgia law presumes that that's because you revoked your will. So it's really important to have the original will and don't lose it. I always say, hey, if you lose your will in a, in a move or a fire or a flood, let me know and let's just re-execute it even if we don't change anything. Now, that's the starting position. We can generally overcome the presumption um, by proving to the court some evidence, hey, the individual never revoked their will. It was simply lost or destroyed unintentionally. It's just a hurdle that you don't want to have to, to try to overcome, especially in the potential event that someone wants to come in and contest your will. That just a whole other you know, you know, layer on top of that. So don't lose your will. <laughs> All right. That's important to know. It really is, you know, because a lot of us don't even keep like our old tax returns around. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. Um, what, um, you mentioned people that can contest it and, um, you know, obviously there's creditors. Give us a little bit of the time frame. you know, who could validly contest it? How do the creditors find it? What's a, a an expectation there? Yeah, good question. So I guess, uh, in order to answer that, I'll kind of walk through the process a little more, um, in detail about how the will gets probated, then what happens next. So as part of the probate process, which is the proving process, um, it's really easy if all the family's getting along uh, to get that admitted to probate and filed. Um, so what it looks like is as part of the probate process, the nominated executor is going to file a petition, usually with the help of their attorney, um, with the probate court of the county where the deceased decedent, where they lived. That petition is going to tell the probate court who are the decedent's heirs at law. Those are the individuals who are notified or have the right to know that this will is being presented to the court as part of the probate process. Um, the heirs at law are not the same as the beneficiaries necessarily. They are the people who, if the decedent had passed away with no will, they would be the people who would be inheriting from the decedent. So think spouse, children, um, if there is no spouse and children, possibly parents or you know, nieces, nephews, cousins, kind of those people right around you, depending on your specific circumstances, are the people who are going to be notified of the process. So if you have um, a will that dis disinherits a, a, biologi a child, a biological adopted child, then they are going to be notified of this probate process. And they're going to be given a statutory 30 day window to object to the will. So your heirs at law have a statutory 30 day window to say, you know what? I don't think that that was mom's valid last will and testament. I think she was unduly influenced. I think she was coerced. I think she didn't have capacity. I'm going to object to this whole process by finding something we call a caveat. So that kind of, and then that turns it into litigation. So. That's kind of the process for actually getting the petition through and granted. Now, like I said before, if everyone, if all the family's on the same page, they can sign off before you file the petition and say, no, we're good. We know that was mom's last will and testament. Go ahead, court, give it your stamp of approval and pass it through. It's just for people that you can't find or people that you know are going to object or they're telling you I'm objecting, they still get that 30 day window. So. 
after a let's assume that the court has approved the petition in the will and is admitted to probate letters testamentary have been issued and so now we have an executor with authority to act so then there is something called a notice to debtors and creditors that gets published in the i think we laughed about this the local uh, county organ of the decedent's county where he lived which is just a local paper um, so in Fulton County, it's the Fulton Daily Report. I think Gwinnett's the Gwinnett Daily Herald. So just a local paper. Uh, and that notice gets run once a week for four weeks, basically saying, hey, if you're a creditor of the estate, this is your time to come and make your claim against the estate and get in line to get paid back. And then that, that opens up a three month window, which is kind of the, the creditor period, so it, it runs for four weeks and then there's a three month window where creditors can come and say, yeah, this estate, this deceased individual owed me money and they can basically get in line. So that's how they are notified that they need to get in line. Okay. So it's interesting, I had a meeting today with a client um, instigated because he's nervous that he's going to go into a few surgeries coming up and just wants to make sure everything's in line for his wife if something happens. So, you know, he did make the statement that they probably have like some credit cards and stuff like that that she doesn't even know about, not because he's hiding something, but because she just doesn't pay attention to their finances. So in that situation, even though the wife might not know to pay it, she's probably going to hear from them that some money's owed, right? And that might be how she learns they to American Express. The credit card companies are very good at, at finding out when someone has passed away and sending those condolence pay me letters. They're great about those even before the notice to debtors and creditors gets run. But generally the recommendation is once the decedent has passed away, go ahead and, unless it's you keeping your lights on and your mortgage paid, you know, if it's a bill that was just owed by the deceased person, go ahead and hold off on paying those until the creditor period has run. Because you want to make sure that you have enough assets to pay all the creditors. And in the event that there, you don't have enough assets, there is a priority of payment. So we want to make sure that people get paid in the correct order. That's important to know. That's good advice. Hopefully not for our clients. I want them to all die with millions of dollars, but um, for somebody somewhere or even, you know, people they, they know and care about, um, you know, my, my uncle comes to mind as somebody that that could be a problem for possibly. And, yeah. you know, we're going to all have that one day. Um, I'm sorry. I do want to say, and you probably have a great resource for your clients too, but we do have something that we share with clients regularly. It's just a, a resource. I think our, one of our attorneys found online, it's called the big book of everything. Essentially it's really just an Excel spreadsheet with different tabs, but your client cool. with the credit cards can put his list of who he has credit cards with in it so that his wife knows, hey, we have accounts with these people. And then you tab over, we have passwords here, tab over, here are our utilities. Yeah. And what I could do, um, anyone can email me for it. I could probably find the link and throw it in the chat at the end of this if anyone wants to download it. It's just an Excel spreadsheet. Cool. I'll actually ask um, Juliana to send that link out to everybody on here. So. Yeah, Later. there should be a QR code at the end. So if anyone is interested, they can um, scan the QR code with your phone at the end and it'll um, auto populate a direct email to schedule a meeting with either David or Rachel. Um, I think it just says like, what do you, who do you want to meet with? Uh, what's your main question? And like, when are you available? Um, so you can you can request to meet with either of them. And Rachel, I did have a question about the credit card thing. You said the priority. Does that have to do with uh, interest rates or like who, how do you deem priority on um, your debt? That's a good question. Yeah, so there is a statutory um, list of who gets paid first and who has priority. So at the very top of the list is, and this is kind of beyond the scope of today, but something called a petition for your support spouses and minor children can file. Then you've got the nominated executor, they get paid next for reimbursement for opening up the estate. Then um, you've also got people who paid for funeral expenses, last illness, they are at the top. Then you have secured debt. So think, um, you know, contract secured debt, then you have unsecured debt. So it kind of goes in that order. So it's not based on the interest rate owed, it's based on that statutory priority. Gotcha, okay, that makes sense. And you sort of, one funny question I've never thought of. 
do you usually have to pay these bills or get life insurance proceeds quicker? Do you usually have to pay the bills or do you get life insurance proceeds quicker? Right. So, for example, you got to pay the bills within like 90 days. Is the life insurance usually pay out that quick so you can use it to pay it off? And, and I think the answer is probably yes. I just thought it was kind of funny. Yeah. Well, yeah. So once a deceased individual has passed away, they know that they can't, you know, there, there's no, um, there's no credit to ding. So kind of those deadlines, 90 day deadlines don't really become an issue anymore. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if insurance is out there, it's as long as they can get the, there's a beneficiary named and they can get the death certificate within a couple of weeks, that would probably come faster. All right, not trying to scam anybody or not pay things off, but a question. They can only go after what's actually in the estate, right? So if the life insurance was owed by, in a life insurance trust, for example, the debtors could not go after that. Yeah, that's a really good question. So we're talking um, probate versus non-probate assets. The, the estate of the decedent, that's the probate estate. And so the creditor claims are going to come after the probate asset. So when you open up the probate estate and you say, okay, the house is in the probate estate because it was just in mom's name, it's got to transfer, the executor has to transfer it over, therefore it's a probate asset. Um, versus an IRA or a 401k or a life insurance policy that has a named beneficiary, that's going to pass automatically outside of the decedent's probate estate. I'm going to throw a caveat in here in case we talk about revocable living trusts. They did just create a statute recently that clarifies that you do still have to pay um, creditor claims on revocable trusts, even though it's non-probate. Okay, Henry. Well, that makes sense, though, because it's really owned by the person beforehand. But that's really interesting about the... Um, the not, you know, the life insurance and the IRAs and stuff being outside of it. Cause like I could see for certain like business owner type people or, you know, if Elton John was my client and he has a big spending problem, but a ton of money, um, you know, <laughs> it's intriguing angle. Not, not that you want to do it. And quite frankly, and I'm just going to do my public service announcement here. seems like this would be a game you could play, but quite frankly, I don't think it, it might be legal, but I don't think it's ethical. And, you know, just uh, spiritually, morally, pay people that you owe, <laughs> even if you yes. can get around that. Yes, there, there is. We never want to defraud people, for sure. Even if it's illegal. <laughs> All right. So anyway, that was just an interesting angle there. Um, hey, so you mentioned your air. I have a Go question ahead and real quick on that. Yeah. Um, I am executor and power of attorney on my mother and one of her bank accounts is a trust and i'm co-trustee another bank account is just she and i both have our names on it it is not a trust so i guess to uh david's coming about legal versus ethical the one that's the trust would definitely need to be dealt with amongst my siblings the other one potentially wouldn't because my name is on it but ethically you know i know it's her money that would be split with them correct yeah and that's something that we talk about a lot is what's the, your potential unintended consequence of what you have in place right now so Whenever you um, own something jointly with somebody else, meaning you're both on the title, the question is, do you own it as joint tenants with rights of survivorship, which would mean the survivor of you, it transfers to the survivor automatically by contract, again, outside the probate process. So if okay. you and your mom are on that account together as JT Ross, joint tenants, rights of survivorship, then yes, that would transfer to you automatically out of her death and to just you. So that could be an unintended consequence that you and your mom and your siblings might want to address and make sure everyone's on the same page. Okay. Tell us, tell us what titling you, I mean, tenants in common, right? So tell explain how there's other titling besides, besides uh, joint tenants' rights and survivorship. Yeah, the other way that you can jointly own property in Georgia is as tenants in common, which would generally, unless you specify, you kind of each own half, so 50-50. It's actually how my husband and I own our house, and so my 50% goes through my will or estate plan, or, or not estate plan if I don't have a will, and then my husband's goes through his estate plan. 
So um, it does not pass automatically and it would pass through by will versus if we owned it as joint tenants with rights of survivorship, it would pass automatically. Other states have other um, tiling as well, joint tenants by the retiree, things like that, but Georgia just has those two. Okay. And then David, one other thing we've done with a lot of our clients at LPL, and I'm sure you could do this at your bank account, is they'll have what's called a trusted person that you can list on the account. And that's almost like having power of attorney, but you know, not having to go through supplying a power of attorney and all that stuff. Basically, you know, a good example is a husband and wife on their IRA. So like, you know, I know I have certain clients where the, it might be the husband's IRA, but if the wife calls up and wants a distribution, you know, that's supposed to be something we process. Um, so that's okay. a great example. Okay. So I like a sign. I'm just like a signer without being an owner. Yes. Good. Yeah, you don't know you have the ability to make decisions on it. So. Okay, cool. Now, you mentioned earlier the heirs at law and talked about possibly disinherited them. And you also talked about what goes through probate, what doesn't. Um, I'd be interested because a lot of people, and you mentioned the revocable living trust, a lot of people will say they want to avoid probate. What's your opinion on that being wise and needed or not Some situations where it might not be a big deal, some situations where it's like, oh, my gosh, you absolutely should avoid probate. Let's yeah. let's go through some of those and, and then some of the structures to do that. Yeah. So in Georgia, where I am and where I practice, um, I start from the position that probate's not a big deal for most people. And that's because Georgia really, if you draft a, a will well, Georgia really stays out of your business. So the process not isn't too complicated. If everyone's on the same page and getting along, you just file that petition with the will and the court checks the box. Yes, everything's good. And then the will can be drafted to where the there's no bond required. The executor doesn't have to file inventories and reports. It just makes it really clean. They still have to notify the beneficiaries what's going on, but they don't have to do stuff with the court process. And so then you're just kind of out of the courts. I, you know, line of sight, you can do what you need to do and be done. So it's not bad here versus California is really expensive. Probate is a percentage of the value of the estate. And um, I think Florida requires an attorney to be involved in probate. I think so it can be expensive and slow down there too. So there are states where probate is that four letter word. It's not generally the case here. Now, we talk about the exceptions. So the exceptions are people who, hey, probate doesn't work for you. And let's let's explore a possibly or revocable living trust for you or people who they experienced the revocable living trust. Maybe their family friend had it or their mom had it or they had it in Florida and they like it. That's fine. If you like it, let's do it. I think there's benefits to it. Um, to people who own property in multiple states, that's always uh, kind of rings the bell for me. Hey, let's explore revocable living trusts for you. Because generally every state where you own property, some type of probate process is going to have to occur to transfer that property from your name into the name of your beneficiaries. And so if you're gotten out, depending on titling, so if you own it jointly with your spouse, maybe you guys can avoid probate on the first passing, maybe not. And then probably on the second passing, you know, you've got property in North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, you've got three, possibly six probates to deal with. So that's a big one. So let's, let's avoid all that completely and just avoid probate altogether. So that's a big one. Um, and then the other, I would say there's two others where it's recommended that we can talk about it and consider it is um, if you are kind of looking towards incapacity, hey, I've been given a diagnosis. I know in the next couple of months or a couple of years, I'm really not going to be able to manage my own property and finances. I really like revocable living trusts, not for the probate purpose, but actually just for managing the assets because the revocable trust has a built-in process and structure for managing assets um, that are in the trust while you're alive. So that's kind of a really nice, you know, generally you're the settlor of the revocable trust, you're the beneficiary and you're also the trustee. But if you become incapacitated, you have already said, David, you're my successor trustee if I can't do it anymore. And then you can just pop up right in just managing my property for me. And then three, it does affect probate if you're going to disinherit someone. Um, this is a huge one because, as we know, if you have a will, those people you are disinheriting, they have a right to come in and contest your estate plan and your will. However, revocable trusts are, they are private documents and people, 
only people who are named as beneficiaries of your documents really have a legal right to know what's in your documents. And so there's no built in statutory structure to make it easy for your disinherited, not loved one, I guess, disinherited <laughs> estranged family member um, to come in and contest your plan. It's very difficult. What I was telling our summer law clerk yesterday, probably how it would have to work is, you know, if I had disinherited, let's say I had a child I disinherited, well, they would have to come in and they would have to guess that I had a revocable trust. Then they would have to try to figure out who is the trustee. Then they would have to open up, basically open up a lawsuit in superior court to try to force the trustee to open up their documents and you know make a claim that they should be entitled to see what's going on. And then from there, try to contest it depending on what it says. So it's just a lot harder. There's no built-in process for, for contesting. Yeah. Wow. You know, and one other that comes to mind, and, and I'll give you a great example of a client I have, um, where you want different kids to inherit different amounts. Sure. And absolutely see how somebody could contest that. And they're thinking, and they, they're doing this well intending, I'm not sure if it's wise or not, is one of their children's very well off financially, the other are, you know, struggling a little bit. And so they want the kids that really need the money to get more of it. That sounds great, but we all know when money's in the picture, people act crazy and do things you wouldn't predict. Sometimes the rich kid might be the one that fights it too, you know? So and they have the funds to fight it because they are rich. So versus the child who doesn't have as much, isn't going to have as much capacity to fight. And I guess tagging onto what you just said, I feel that if you're going to treat children differently, if you tell them while you're alive, and, you, and I know it's a not, not a fun conversation, but if you tell them what's going on beforehand and they're not shocked and they're not mad and angry and hurt and all the emotions and you know thinking there's no way mom could have done this. I mean, it's never a guarantee, but it, there's definitely a lower likelihood of them contesting the documents when they know this was definitely explained to me and I knew this was coming. Cool. Um, you mentioned incapacity plan with the revocable living trust. Just curiosity, if somebody's at the very early phases of dementia, but still like kind of there, are they considered able and capable of creating estate documents or would they be considered incapacity at that point? So Georgia assumes that any adult is sui juris, meaning they have legal capacity to do all of those things for themselves. Um, that said, that's not always the case. We know just because they assume that that's a starting point, we have to do the analysis of can the person sign the documents. And so that's part of my process when someone comes to me is I do the analysis of, do I feel comfortable having this individual sign these documents? Do I think they understand what they mean? They understand the consequences. We know who the loved ones are. We know generally what they own. And this is a rational plan and they've explained to me why they wanna do it. So, I mean, it's kind of in terms of like an estate plan, but same process for the power of attorney. Do they know what it means? Who's their person that they've chosen as agent? Why is that our person? Do you understand that you're giving them all this power? So that's part of the process and it's hard to say yes or no, but it would be an analysis that we do. Yeah. Um, all right, three more questions. I know we're coming up on time. So right. that's uh, been a great conversation. I'm glad I went through my part quick. We should have just done the whole hour of question and answer with uh, Rachel, that would have been great. Um, so what about real estate? And tell us some things there, because, you know, I mean, obviously, like, you inherit your mom and dad's house or, you know, a couple of houses, and you might want to sell them. What, what is, what's different about that than, like, a bank account? Hmm, that's a good question. Anything. So, I'm just thinking through various answers. All right, so a couple things to consider that real estate – our wills at least are going to give the executor the authority to sell that property if it's in the estate without having to get court approval. But if you don't have a well-drafted will, you might have to go to court and ask the court to basically bless the sale, meaning here's what I want to sell it for. That's a good deal. The beneficiaries get to have their say. So that can be an issue. So something to consider. Um, and then beyond you, that, you Bill, and uh, it doesn't have to be a revocable living trust. Yeah, no, do, correct. A will can give the power to sell without court permission. 
Um, you still have to have the executor appointed, but once he's appointed, yeah, you can sell and do what you need to do to get the estate in order. Um, so that'll be something to consider. Beyond that, you know, you can think about, well, what's, what's the best way to handle this? So the executor, once they're named executor with their letters testamentary, would say, I don't know, I left a piece of property to my, my cousin. Um, and my executor is going to have the option, usually, unless my will specifies, he can just deed it over to my cousin and then she can deal with it. Um, or he can sell it and he can then distribute the proceeds to my cousin. So usually he's going to have just his discretion to do one or the other. When we're talking about multiple people inheriting a piece of property, that's where it can be a little bit more tricky because what if three people inherit a piece of property? Um, should the executor try to sell the property and just distribute the proceeds evenly? That's probably cleanest. Um, or should he just deed the property out to the three beneficiaries and make them deal with what happens next? That might be the easiest for the, for the executor, but not the easiest for the beneficiaries. Um, so just something to consider as you're making your plan. If you have a preference, maybe make your preference known. I love it. Three beneficiaries, two want to hold it, one wants to sell it, and then they can all fight over it. Even if they're well all intended. the time. Oh, yeah. All the time. Well, think about what if you have, okay, here's a really common one. You've got two beneficiaries, they're siblings, they're also named co-executors. So they have equal say, equal ownership of everything that's coming through the will. One saying, let's sell it to this buyer for this great price you know, because I want to cash out and be done. And this one's saying, no, no, I want to keep it. It was mom's. Let's keep it forever and make it a family farm. What do you do? That, the coin. <laughs> not, there, it's not good. I'll tell you the answer is not good. So okay. something else to consider unintended consequences. This is back to like when you're like in elementary school, you just wrestle over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you pay all the fees to wrestle over it, yes. Yeah, now I had this one uh, in here from when we talked earlier, and I thought this was interesting. Um, how long does someone have to survive someone else to get their share of the assets? Oh, okay. Um, in our, in, so you can say, I think you and I were talking about this in terms of, of a financial account. I was asking, because I think people have passed really close together, and I was wondering, does the contract say how long you have to survive someone to be considered to have survived them? Sure, so, yeah. You yeah. Died with each other type thing, and we've had that this year. Yeah, and so um, in, I can't recall if Georgia has a statutory provision. I don't think that they do in terms of you have to survive by the X amount of days. I think it's just survive or not survive. I know in, in our documents, we usually will include a survivorship, survivorship presumption that in order to be considered a beneficiary in the document, you need to survive at least 30 days. And that's just to make it really easy for the people who are administering the estate. You know, the people are passing really quickly. You think about you've got a, or if they kind of pass at the same time, you would have to open up a, an estate for the deceased person and then transfer it over versus if they are presumed not to have survived, then we can just kind of skip them and go to the next person. It just makes it a little bit cleaner. Okay. And then last question, are there any common mistakes you see people make that we want to be 100% sure these people on the call today are, um, are hearing and don't do? Yeah, I would say... Um, Probably the biggest, I, there's a handful that are the biggest mistakes. Uh, the number one is naming the wrong executor. And so that's obviously in your, in your state plan doc, it's not on the probate side, but it's really important to name a good person. It shouldn't be the oldest kid just because he's oldest. We really want to talk about who's the best fit for this. So that's one, pick the right person. And then for the executor, what I, the most common calls I get from people, because I do some, some uh, fiduciary litigation. One of those common calls I get is, this thing's taking forever. I have, I'm the beneficiary. I have no idea what's going on. The executor won't talk to me. I can't get any information. I don't know what's happening. And I think he's doing something wrong. I'm convinced he's, you know, he's stealing from the estate or whatever. And it's because there's no communication. So if you are the executor or you're a fiduciary, 
just be above board transparent, communicate, give them everything. And so that there's no chance that they can come back and say, you know, you lied, you steal, you stole, you cheated, et cetera. So I would say that's a huge one. And then um, another practical one would be missing assets. So it's really important as part of your job as executor to make sure that you track down all the assets that didn't pass automatically by joint ownership and beneficiary designation to you track them all down so that you can transfer them to the beneficiaries. Um, it happens multiple times a year. I have a client who was an executor. They did the whole the whole shebang. I said, did you get everything? Did you find everything? Did you transfer everything? Yes, yes, yes. And then they call me after we close the estate and they say, oh, I just found this account still in still in dad's name. Can I can I just transfer it over because I'm the executor still? And I say, no, we actually closed the estate. So you have to now reopen the estate in order to transfer that asset over. So, you know, do your due, do your, do your due diligence and really look for all the assets would be probably another big one. Those are great. I'm really glad to hear that. And, um, to me, at least the um, communication really spoke to me because we all lead busy lives and sometimes without even meaning to, you can forget to communicate about that stuff. That's cool. Well, thank you, Rachel. Any parting words or anything before we wrap up? Um, oh gosh, I think I've talked enough. Thank you though. All right. Well, we will um, definitely have you back if you'll uh, let us. And so um, here's the QR code that Juliana was talking about. Um, happy to meet with any of y'all about anything. And then of course, Rachel's happy to meet with any of y'all about anything. And um, I really, you know, would like to say um, this stuff, think, think back to what we said about goals, you know, long term, we all want our heirs to have a good experience uh, divvying up our estates and things like that. And quite frankly, when you're gone, you can't do things to change those. And so a good intermediate goal could be this year or over the next three years, make sure you have all those documents in place and check up, up on them. And then talk to the executors, help them do it. And then also, of course, to summarize back with the, um, the insurance or excuse me, the um, investments, you know, taking the long view there and thinking of some of this stuff, you know, in more of a, a long-term goal perspective versus just short-term fluctuations. So thank you guys for attending. Thank you so much, Rachel. Really hope um, some of you guys reach out to and communicate with Rachel and improve your um, estate plans and, and other legal needs. And I will see you guys next month. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone.